Sure. You've got a mask on. <clears throat> You'll be okay. <clears throat> All right. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. <laughs> no one wants to answer. Some thumbs up. Some wonderfuls. Good. 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 It was cold this morning. I woke up. My house was freezing, and uh, like fr- I mean. It, I've been heating, we heat with a wood stove. So I went downstairs and it was like 60 degrees downstairs, which means upstairs was like probably 55, 58. It's cold. I went outside, it was 10 degrees. Anyway, we're, um, we're going to get right into the Bible this morning. Um, turn with me to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. My dad wanted to make sure I wasn't teaching on Hebrews. So, because I guess he is this morning in church, so. I'm not teaching on Hebrews. We won't, even, we won't even look at any verses in Hebrews. We won't even talk about any verses. So anyway, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll start in Acts chapter 7. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this time that you've given us. We thank you for this day. God, we thank you for the uh, ability and the opportunity we have to come and worship, to hear your word. I pray that you'd help us to grow this morning, help us to uh, just be attentive to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Acts chapter 7, we're going to talk this morning about Moses. Um, it, it's, uh, it, in the day that we live in, really the past 10 years, it's kind of been this, this big theme about identity, right? Everybody's looking to belong to something. Everybody's looking to belong to some group or, or, or another. Everyone's looking to find their identity in something. Um, people look to, they look to place identity in nationality, they look to place their identity in their gender. They look to place their identity in sexuality. Uh, they want to place their identity in career. They want to place their, their identity in, in, in so many different things. And, and it's kind of like this constant, this constant battle. We see it even getting more and more in our, in our culture today. Really, though, as believers, we find our identity in Jesus Christ. And I know that in this room, most of us have have a personal relationship with Jesus, if not all of us, and we've, we've had a relationship with Jesus for a very long time, but I found these truths to be a great reminder to myself, especially in the, the culture wars that we're a part of today, <clears throat> and what we're going to continue to fight at, in culture wars going on in the future as well. It gives us a good idea and reminds us of our, our standing before God. Our identity is found in Christ. <clears throat> And God has a special calling that's unique to each and every one of us. And again, most, m- many of us are, are older. We're, you know, 30s and older. Um, we won't go above that age because I don't want to offend anybody who's older than that. But um, <clears throat> we, we feel as if maybe we already know God's calling for our life. So, you know, how does this, how, how can I relate to this? Well, I think you'll find some of the truths that we read today um, that God will be able to speak to you through them. We're going to talk about the fact that God has a special calling unique to each of us. God knows us. He's given us gifts. He's given us a calling. And he's going to qualify us for our calling, but he expects us to act on our, on our calling as well. Acts chapter 7, verse number 17, the Bible says this. But when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham. Remember, that was um, the promise that God had sworn to Abraham was that his people would, would live in in the promised land forever. And they find themselves in Egypt now in captivity. So the time of the promise now we see is this this freeing from captivity from Egypt. The people grew and multiplied in Egypt till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. The same dealt subtly with our kindred and evil entreated our fathers so that they cast out their young children to the end they might not live. In which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair And nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. The first thing I want to talk about, the first truth that I want to talk about from the scriptures this morning is the fact that God knows you. God knows you. Think about the fact that of all the people in the world, the 8 billion people or however many billion people there are in the world, God knows you personally and knows you specifically. Right? He knows you. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse number 5. Jeremiah 
God is telling Jeremiah this. He says, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before, you know, at the beginning of time, God knew you. Before Adam and Eve were created, God knew you. And today, God knows you. And today, God has a specific plan for your life. You know, as we think about the times that we live in, right, there's a lot of anxiety that people have. There's a lot of fear that people have. Um, you know, people are so concerned about what's going on in, in the world and in America specifically and in government and in, polit in politics. But Moses is born during this time in Egypt when Pharaoh had commanded all of the babies born in Egypt to be murdered. This is the time that Moses is born. Yet God had a plan for Moses before Moses was born. God had a plan for Moses before Pharaoh made the commandment that all the babies in Egypt were to be killed. And no matter what circumstances we find ourselves in, no matter what things are going on around us in our culture <clears throat> and in our country, God knows you and has a specific plan for you. He knows the times that we're living in. He understands them. Um, <clears throat> nothing's out of God's control. There is nothing that's out of God's control. All of the babies were commanded to be murdered. And this is when God is going to bring the leader of Israel. That's when he's going to have them born. Have him born. Think about that fact this morning as, as we think about what's happening around us. Really, it doesn't matter. You know, one of the reasons I, I love church is because we can escape all of the political world around us and we can escape everything that's happening. But it doesn't, we need to be reminded that it doesn't matter who the president of the United States is. It doesn't matter who's in control of Senate. And it doesn't matter who's in control of Congress because God knows what's happening. And God is still in control. And no matter what happens, God is going to continue to be in control. We have brothers and sisters all around the world who don't have nearly the freedoms that we have. Yet, their faith is, pro is I guaranteed stronger than the majority of Americans' faith. And they're persecuted each and every day. God's in control no matter what. God uh, intimately knows you. But God also knew that you would be his child. He knew that you would be a believer. I, I don't believe like, you know, in, in the doctrine that teaches that God picks and chooses who, who's going to be saved. But we do know that God ultimately foreknows who is going to accept him as, as, his, as their savior. Romans chapter 8 verse 29 for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. God knew that you were going to accept Jesus as his savior, so his plan for your life was your sanctification. God knew that you would need him. He knows that everybody needs him, but he ultimately knew that you would become his child. He knew that you would put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But just because God knows us doesn't necessarily mean that we know him. Now, we have to understand that while God knows you personally, God also knows the person across the street or next door or down the road who doesn't know him as their savior. God knows that person as well. And just because they don't know God as their savior doesn't mean that God doesn't know them. If you're, you know, again, most of us in here have made professions of faith, but maybe someone who listens to this later doesn't, isn't trusting in Jesus as their personal savior. Well, God knows who you are, you may not know who God is. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says this, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Faith alone in Christ alone is the only way to receive grace. It's not something we achieve, it's not something we work for. It's something that we're given freely by God. So God knows you, and the, and the question that I would want to end this with is, do you know God? And yes, we may say, well, we know him, as, we know him that, that he is our Savior. We know him that he's the creator of the world. But do you know that what he can do for your life? Do you know that he can empower you to live and, and fulfill the plan that he has? God knows you. We can just rest in the fact that no matter what happens, God knows us. The second truth I want to talk about is the fact that God has given you gifts. God has given you gifts. Acts chapter 7, verse number 22. It 
And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. It's funny, the, the very gifts that God had given Moses, Moses is going to use to argue to God later on about why he can't do what God wants him to do. The Bible tells us here in verse number 22 that Moses was mighty in words and in deeds. Well, what was one of the excuses, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but what was one of the excuses that Moses used to God when God called him? Say it louder. I can't, Frank. Yeah, he says, I'm not a good speaker. And now maybe living in the backside of the desert for 40 years, maybe that affected his, his speaking ability. You know, when you've got sheep and your wife and, and her family to talk to, that could be stressful. I understand that. Not your wife, but. Um. <laughs> no, but it's, it, God gave him gifts. He grew up, he grew up in the house of Pharaoh. He got all of the teaching. He went to all of the best universities. He was learned in all the ways of Egypt. Every person has gifts that God has given them. We all have gifts that God has, has blessed us with. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 8, the Bible says this, When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. He gave each and every one of us a gift. Now, he gives it, or some of us, several gifts. He gives us these gifts not so we can hide them, not so we can store them away. Not so we can, you know, yeah, I don't know what other illustration I can give. I just gave hiding. and He gave us our gifts so we could use them. He has gifted us specifically. Moses is this highly intelligent individual. He's a gifted speaker. He's a natural born leader. I mean, he's raised in the house of Pharaoh. The person that he has to look, to, to look at as an example is the leader of the most powerful nation in the world. He's a gifted leader. And God has given each and every one of us unique gifts for his glory. Now, maybe he hasn't given you the gift of speaking in public. Or maybe he hasn't given you the gift of, you know, of, of being able to live in the house of Pharaoh and, and go to the best universities. And maybe he hasn't given you those gifts, but he's given you each specific gifts that he wants you to use. But not every, not every person uses their gifts. So many people waste the time and the talents that God has given them. So many people, you, you could actually, if you just look at our pop culture today, you can see all these gifted musicians and all these gifted singers. And these are gifts that, that they have been blessed with, and yet they're not used for God's glory. They're not used for anything with meaning in life, except to make these people more money and to, you know, they, they, they come out with, you know, they have their agendas that they come out with, but they're not used really for anything great in life. God has equipped us all with gifts. Uh, gifts 1 Corinthians 10, 31. We're reminded, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. It's funny because I, I love how in 1 Corinthians 10, when God is, is, is when the Holy Spirit is speaking to Paul to write this, he, he doesn't just say, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Because then we could come up with excuses. Like, okay, well, whatever doesn't really mean what whatsoever, right? Like, you know, I don't have to give God's, God glory when I'm driving my car. I don't, well, he gives the, the preface by saying, whether you eat or drink, no matter what you do, he, he gives the example of something that we have to do every single day. How many of you ate something today? I didn't eat anything. Wow, not many people ate something today. That's kind of, you ate something. You didn't raise your hand. Maybe you're just not raising your hand. Not many people ate something. But how many of you drank something, whether it's water or coffee or you're drinking something now? How many of you plan to eat something today? Everybody should raise their hand. Come on. You guys are like worse than teenagers. Adam's like, I'm going to calories. I'm not eating anything. It's easier to count that way. <laughs> now you're thinking. He gives the example of something that we have to do most of the time that we enjoy to do. Right? How many of you enjoy eating? We, uh, we bought recently um, with a couple people, we bought uh, half of a cow. And um, one of the best decisions I think we've made um, in like eight and a half years of marriage. I don't think we've made a better decision. And so, 
<laughs> you think I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> so last week, um, we had, last Sunday, we had the brisket. And I really wanted to smoke the brisket because that's the way to do it. But um, I didn't, we don't have a smoker in it. You know, I couldn't get, I couldn't get the, the request through purchasing in time to get a smoker. And um, so I decided to do this. I looked up this great recipe. How many of you have never had brisket in your life? Have you never had brisket? Oh, you are missing out. So brisket is the, it's, it's the breast of the cow, basically. And brisket is this wonderfully delicious food if treated properly. It holds up about 60% of the cow's weight. So it can be very tough if it's not cooked right. And it's like eating shoe leather. However, when prepared properly, as they do in Texas, or um, it's, a, it's a traditional Jewish, um, Jewish meal as well. Now, now, I will say this. I have, to, I have to clarify. You'll never have as good of a brisket until you go to Texas and have actual Texas barbecue brisket. Yeah, so, I mean, anybody had actual Texas barbecue brisket? I have in Texas. Not like at Dinosaur Barbecue, but like in Texas. Yeah, it's so good. I, I was at a wedding a couple years ago, and... Um, it was an interesting wedding. My, my good friend of mine got married, and he is his uh, nationality is his, his dad is from India, and his wife is Texican. She's like half Texan and half Mexican, and so at, that's a real thing. You're giving me a weird look. That's a real thing. Okay, I've obviously never been to Texas. Anyway, um, I'm used to them giving me weird looks. Anyway, uh, so so the the. The um, rehearsal dinner the night before, we had traditional Indian food, which was great, you know. And then for the reception at the wedding, we had traditional Texas barbecue. I didn't say I, I didn't say uh, corn and, and and lima beans. Yeah, it was traditional Indian food. It was it was curry and I don't know what else, but it was really good. Curry's the only Indian dish I know off the top of my head. It was good and spicy. And, um, but then the next day we had, we had Texas barbecue for the wedding reception. And I've never had barbecue at a wedding reception, but this was, I mean, the brisket was so good. Anyway, we're way off track. <laughs> Going back to my illustration, I, I, I enjoy eating, so we had this brisket, and the plan was to have family dinner Sunday, and we're going to make this brisket. We didn't have a smoker, and I couldn't get it. I had a friend who had a smoker, and he offered to smoke it when he smoked uh, the bacon that he smoked. He's, he's the guy I bought the cow from, and, but it wasn't enough time. So I, so I said, yeah, I'm just going to, I'm going to, we're going to risk it. If it's bad, it's bad. We'll never do it again. So I wrapped the whole thing in bacon, applewood smoked bacon, thick nitrate-free bacon, because that's the only way to eat bacon. And I wrapped the whole thing in bacon. And, um, but the night before, I made, a, I made this wonderful dry rub, and I, I, I rubbed it on the brisket and let it sit overnight. And then I wrapped it in bacon right before I cooked it. I put it in the oven on 275 for, for four hours, and then turned the oven off and let it sit in there for another hour. And then turned the broiler on and crisped the fat on the top. Oh. And we cut into that and ate it. And I was actually scolded for eating too much of it. It was so good. Not as good as real Texas brisket, but it was really good. So when I say that buying half of this cow was one of the best decisions we made in our marriage, I'm not lying. It was a really good decision. So I enjoy eating food probably just as much as you do. And it was terrible for me to talk about that because I haven't eaten anything yet. So now I'm starving. But he uses the example of something that we do every day over and over and over again. Some of us more than others. And it says, in that task that you do every day, give God glory. So if we're supposed to give God glory in the way that we eat, in the way that we drink, well, we're supposed to give God glory in everything else that we do. And the things that we post on Facebook. And the things that we talk about with our friends, in the gifts that God has given us, if ultimately we're not using them for his glory, then we failed. 
Mr. Thompson, who, who said, I forgot to look this quote up, and you've, I remember when I was learning guitar, you said it, or maybe you didn't, and I'm just imagining that. There was a, a, a famous composer who said that the, the, entire, the ultimate purpose of music is to bring honor and glory to God. Got me, I don't know. Uh, so, someone said it, someone famous. Someone Google it and let me know. No, I think it was Bach. It might have been like Bach or something, I don't know. Like Johann Sebastian, um, if, in case anybody's wondering. Someone Google it and find out. But, but they said that the ultimate purpose of music is to glorify God. Um, you taught me that, so maybe you've just forgotten. What's that? I forgot. He, uh, you forgot. You forgot. It was Bach. You took lessons from him? Yeah. yeah. It was Johann Sebastian Bach. He said that the ultimate purpose of music is to bring honor and glory to God. The Westminster Confession or the Westminster Catechism says this. The, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Our ultimate purpose and our ultimate goal in life is to glorify God in every single thing that we do. But so many people don't. We waste the gifts that God has given us. When ultimately he's given us those gifts to be used for the calling that he's called us to. So God, is, God knows me intimately. God has given me gifts. God has given me a calling. God has given each and every person here a calling. Now ultimately God gives you a calling with what he wants you to do with your life. And we're not even going to specifically talk about that. When we look at the life of Moses, we see this calling that God has given him. Look with me at verse 23. And when he, was full for, um, <clears throat> when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing, them, uh, seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. But they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again saying, Sirs, your brethren, why do ye wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at this saying, and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons. Let's just pause there before we go to the next verse. He supposed, verse number um, Verse number 25, he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. God is doing something in Moses' life as he looks out and he sees the affliction that his brothers and sisters, the children of Israel, are going through. And God is doing something in his life, and I believe God starts to call Moses to this task of being the one to free the children of Israel from their bondage. And he takes matters into his own hand, doesn't he? But God gives him a unique calling. And I believe God is working through this passage. God is working in Moses' life even now, before he goes into the desert. God calls Moses to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. And we'll, we'll go back to that calling, uh, or we'll go back to the, um, the mistake that Moses makes here. But I believe God is already working in Moses' life to do what God has called him to do. And it's a unique calling to Moses, just as God's calling would be unique to you. Let's continue. Verse number uh, 30. He goes to the backside of the desert. <clears throat> and when 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness in Mount Sinai, an angel of the Lord and a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight. And as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham. And the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled and durst not behold. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt. God specifically calls Moses to do the task that God wants done. It's God, ultimately, we understand, who's going to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. It's not Moses. But God is calling Moses to be the human, to be the person that is going to fulfill his calling, that's going to fulfill his plan. But listen, while God may have called, some, uh, called my dad and Pastor Ethan to pastor this church, 
that doesn't mean that God's calling on their life is any more special than God's calling on your life. It's just more specific. It's just a different calling. Whether God has called you to, um, I don't know what God has called you to do. It doesn't matter. If God has called you to, to be a rocket scientist or to be a plumber, it doesn't matter. Whatever God has called you to is unique to you and is special and is ultimately what God wants for you. We need rocket scientists. We also need plumbers. I have a specific plumber that I use. I love him. He's awesome. He's great. God has maybe called you to some other trade. We need people with specific trades, right? God's calling is unique to you. Whether God has called you to lead or to follow, his calling is unique to you. Don't ever think that God's calling on your life is insignificant. God calls Moses to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, but God is going to call the children of Israel to follow Moses. And unless, and, and we're going to see, it doesn't, well, we won't see today, but we know throughout reading our Bible and throughout history, they didn't always follow very well. And they didn't always follow God very well. But remember, Moses tried to take matters into his own hands ahead of time and tried to, tried to move God's timetable up. Moses also had to learn to follow. There's a saying that um, used to be said that's not politically correct anymore, so I will, I will make it politically correct for us here today. You can't lead until you know how to follow. The saying was, you, you got to be an Indian before you can be a chief, right? Not politically correct anymore. But you can't lead unless you learn how to follow. And obviously, I don't really care about being politically correct 100% of the time, but you understand what I'm saying. You have to learn how to lead, or how to follow, if you're going to learn how to lead. And um, Moses jumped God's timeline. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But God has given each and every one of us a calling. God is going to qualify us for his calling. He's going to qualify each and every one of us for his calling. Look at verse number 29. Then fled Moses at this, at this saying, and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons. Now jump back in your Bibles, or it's going to be on screen as well, to the book of Exodus chapter 3. In Exodus chapter 3, we'll read verses 11 through 15. I'll give you a couple minutes to finish turning there. And Moses said unto God, who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he, that, that's God, said, certainly I will be with thee. And this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God <clears throat> upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said, Moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. First, we need to understand, you are not qualified for what God has called you to do. You are not qualified for what God has called you to do. You're not. You may have gifts that God has given you that he wants you to use for his calling for you, but you're not qualified to do what he wants you to do. If you feel that you're qualified for what God wants you to do, then most likely you will fail. Philippians chapter 3, verse number 4, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Paul is even saying, if anybody, did I put the wrong verse up there? Oh no, it's there, I'm sorry. Um, if, if anybody could think that they were qualified to do what God wanted them to do, Paul probably could say that. He then goes on to give this list. We, I don't have the verses, but he talks about how he was raised in the best Hebrew schools. He followed the law. He was a Pharisee, yet he understood that he wasn't qualified to do 
what God wanted him to do. Moses tried to do it his own way first. Remember? He killed the Egyptian. And then he went back out and saw the two Hebrews fighting and said, guys, listen, you, why are you fighting with each other? He took matters into his own hands and realized he couldn't do it by himself. Because Moses moved God's timeline up and moved before God had him ready to go, he ends up having to run for his life. He ends up having to run for his life. And often people will try to move God's time, timetable up in their life. Or they'll try to act on God's calling with their own power and with their own strength, and it ends up becoming a, a huge mess. Moses ends up killing somebody and running away. Now, Romans chapter 8 reminds us that all things work together for good to those that love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. God is able to take this, 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 um, this uh, premature action by Moses, and he's able to use it specifically for his plan. Moses goes to the backside of the desert where he ends up finding his wife. And he ends up finding his wife's, well, his wife's father is, is going to be used by God greatly later on when Moses is facing difficulty with leading the children of Israel through giving him advice. And God is going to take the next 40 years. Can you imagine 40 years? Some of us aren't even 40 years old. And then some of us, they look back and say, wow, 40 years just went by just like that. But for those of us who aren't 40 yet, <laughs> which would be, it looks like the majority of people in this room, 40 years, 40 years of Moses' life was spent doing what he wanted, learning in the schools of the Egyptians, learning the customs of the Egyptians learning how to be a leader in Egypt. And then God took 40 years to reteach him, to break down his thinking and to build him back up. I'm 31 years old. I haven't even lived for 40 years. So, so I can't imagine the time, the timetable of 40 years. But 40 years ago, my dad was, what, 30? What? 15? <laughs> I don't know, how old are you, how old are you 40 years ago? He doesn't even know. 20, 23. See, I was giving you, I was saying you were look way younger. I said 15. He was 23, 40 years ago. Well, then I said 15. See, I made up for it. I made up for it. Is, uh, who, who is, who is, what's that? Get back to Who is 23 years old or younger? 40 years ago, you weren't even as old as my dad, or, or, or you're not even as old now as my dad was 40 years ago. I, I, I'm just using that as a point that for us, you know, who are younger, 40 years looks like a long time, but when you look back at your life after you've, after you've reached that, that age of 40, it just goes by quickly, right? But God takes 40 years to rebuild Moses' way of thinking, and now God meets him in the desert, and what's Moses' response to God? It's not, oh, right, let's go. It's, I'm not ready to do this. Who am I? 40 years ago, he was ready to start a revolution and, and kill Egyptians and, and free, you know, free the children of Israel that way. And now, 40 years later, he says, who am I? I, I can't do this. He realized that only God can qualify can qualify us for his calling. Only God can qualify us. Now, he gives God excuses, which is not good, because you know what happens when, God gives, when we give God excuses? God says, I don't want to hear your excuses. <laughs> Do you know who I am? That's what he says to Moses. <clears throat> Moses says, God, I'm going to go to, Israel. I'm going to, go to Egypt and tell the, the children of Israel, God has sent me. And they're going to say, Okay, and who is this God? Who has sent you? He's like, a, he's like a teenager. And what is God's response? I am that I am. And you're going to tell them when they ask that I am hath sent you. Philippians 2.13 It is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. 
You know, there's this, there's this saying that, that's been said many, many times, and, it, and it's this. God doesn't call the qualified, but he qualifies the called. And it, but as you look at scripture, and as you look through the, the examples of people throughout history, really, God takes people who maybe everybody else would look at as, why is God going to use this person? Or how is God going to use this person? And God uses them to do great things, because they realize that it's God who needs to do the work through them. God takes Moses to the desert for 40 years to get him to a place where he understood he needs God to do the work if it's going to be accomplished. You know, there's this, there's this trend in modern Christianity today where we hear over and over again how good we are. And we hear over and over again how we can do anything. Or we hear this verse out of context so many times, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. The verse is talking, that verse that's taken out of context so many times is talking about being content, whether you're abounding or whether you're afflicted. Now, yes, God will strengthen us to his calling. But listen, it's God who does the work through us. You're not good enough. You're not. But God is good enough. God is the one who is going to make it, is going to make it happen. God is the one who's going to give you strength. John 15 verse 5 tells us this. Um, Jesus says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Just like if you take a branch off of a tree and you cut it down and just shove it into the dirt, nothing's going to happen because it needs to dwell in the tree. Without Jesus, without God, we can do nothing. It's God who's going to qualify us for his calling. But then once he qualifies us, he wants us to act on that calling. We have to act on his calling. Verse number 35 and 36 of Acts chapter 7. The Bible says this. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, who made thee a ruler and a judge 40 years ago? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. God is going to call you. God is going to prepare you. And then it's time to act. But newsflash. What do we do while we're waiting for God's specific calling on the rest of my life? And what do I do? What do I do while God is preparing me? What am I supposed to do? Just do something. The young adults and I, we, we went through a book, that book. It's a, there's a, this little book called Just Do Something. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we went through that book together. Well, some of us read it. Others just listened. Um, but we went through this book together. Just do something. God wants you to do something for his kingdom. While we're waiting, you know, teenager, while you're waiting for God's specific call in your life or college student, you don't know what you're going to do. Just do something. We know that the Bible tells us, and this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Every single person's will, God's will for every single person is for them to grow in their faith <clears throat> and to grow in their knowledge of God. Moses obeyed God's calling, and God used him uh, to free his people. But, but Moses didn't quite understand this right away. Initially, 40 years prior, when, God, when Moses felt God calling him, he acted in his own strength and his own ability. He did his own thing. He didn't act according to the word of God. The way that we're to act now is according to the word of God. So what is that? How are we supposed to act? Well, we know for sure that our calling not only is sanctification and growing in faith, but our calling is to spread the gospel. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. The Bible says this. Jesus says, Ye shall be witnesses. Ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. You are supposed to be a witness. What does a witness do? A witness tells what they've seen. Tells what they've experienced. In court. When someone's being tried, they will call witnesses to the stand. And the witness is supposed to say, this is what I saw. God has called, called us to be witnesses. Well, what am I supposed to say? Tell people about what God has done in your life. 
Tell about how God has changed you. 1 Peter 2.9, Peter says this, You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye, and here's the purpose, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Colossians 1.13, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, Colossians 2.13, and you being dead in your sins and um, and this uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with uh, with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses. Tell about what God has done in your life. Tell about the forgiveness that God has given you. Tell about the peace that God has brought to your life. Tell tell people about the acceptance of, that God has given you. He's made us, the Bible says, accepted in the beloved. Tell about the family that you found among believers. When was the last time you shared your faith? When was the last time you shared the gospel? While you're waiting for God's calling, do that. While you're doing God's calling, do that. We'll be reminded today that God knows you intimately. He's given you gifts and he's given you a calling. He's the one who's going to qualify you for your calling, but he expects you to act. There's nothing special about Moses and himself. And it would be mean for me to say, but there's nothing special about you and yourself. But God allowed Moses to use him. And God was able to do great things through Moses' life. God wants to do great things in your life, whether you're 12 years old or whether you're 78 years old. God wants to do great things in your life. God wants to use you. But you have to understand, you can't do it by yourself. It's God who's going to do the work through you and in you. So let's be challenged today. Let's be encouraged. God knows you. God wants you to do his calling and God wants you to spread the gospel. We can be encouraged by that, but let's also be challenged that God knows you. God has a calling for you. We need to act on on his calling. We need to spread the gospel. We need to share our faith. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the example of scripture. We thank you for Moses. I pray that you'll help each and every one of us to be encouraged this morning, but also to be challenged. We pray, God, now that you bless the Uh, service this morning. We pray that what we do, what we say, and what we sing would bring honor and glory to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.